Um, good morning, everyone, and could I firmly open the meeting and welcome you to today's meeting with the Public Petitions Committee. I uh, could remind everyone to switch off their mobile phones and electronic devices because it does interfere with our sound system. Um, I've received apologies from Chick Brody, and could I welcome Adam Ingram uh, to the committee, who replaces, uh, replaces Richard Lyle, and thanks on behalf of the committee to the contribution made by uh, Richard Lyle. So our agenda item one is declaration of interest. Um, the first item is a declaration of interest by Adam Ingram. In accordance with section three of the Code of Conduct, could invite Adam Ingram to declare any inter uh, interest relevant to the remit of the committee. I have no relevant declarable interests, uh, convener. So, um... Thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, agenda item two is decision on taking business in private. The next item of business seeks the committee's agreement to take item six, consideration of evidence heard at item three, and then item seven on the terms of reference for the inquiry in private. Is the committee agreed that both these items can be taken in private? Agreed. Thank you. Um, we have agreed that we take evidence from the Minister of Community Safety and Mosquito Devices. Uh, the Minister now will be in at 10.30, so with your permission I'll change the agenda so we can take agenda item four, which is one of our new petitions. It's PE 1437 by Les Wallace on recycling in schools. Uh, members have a note by the clerk, the spice briefing and the petition. And could I welcome our witness, uh, Les Wallace, for coming along. I'm very grateful for you coming along today. Mr Wallace, I appreciate your, your time. And can invite you to make a short presentation. We're fairly liberal with uh, time uh, this morning. Um, so between five and ten minutes, um, I would like you now to make a short presentation. And then I'll start by asking you a few questions. Mr Wallace. Right, thank you very much and uh, first of all uh, thank you very much for letting me speak here. Um, I first became involved in the issue with uh, re uh, education relating to recycling and reduced matters in February 1989, so it's been quite a long period. Um, at that time I was uh, one of the original members of a curbside collection scheme in Falkirk District. So it was one of the original schemes that reintroduced curbside uh, recycling to Scotland. Within a period of a few weeks, it became blatantly obvious to me that the thing wasn't going to work, that there were various, there were a set of very serious problems with the way it was being implemented. And I have to say, I think the most serious one of those was a general failing with education. There was very little attention was paid to the whole purpose of getting information on reduce, reuse, recycle out to the public. And even worse, there was a very little actual interest in going into schools and developing a recycling ethos in schools. That is in spite of the fact there was a considerable amount of rhetoric, even at that time, about how important it was to catch children, get them young, um, common sense. And I certainly know from my own experience that it is not an urban myth or wishful thinking that young children, when they get an opportunity to recycle, uh, they're extremely enthusiastic about it. Uh, and I've, and I've, you know, I've got personal experience of that. What I've found, that isn't the problem. The problem is that it's institutional apathy in providing young children with an opportunity to get hands-on recycling. And that's a serious failing I've seen going back over 20 years now. And I have to say there's a shared blame for that. There's some blame from central government in terms of policy, a lot of blame in local authorities, a lot of blame on the Green Movement because it didn't pay as much attention to that issue as it should have done, and even to some degree an element of blame in education departments and schools. It's a shared blame, I have to say. Um, so basically that's what I'm he say here today, is to say that we really have to establish mandatory, basic mandatory standards in the implementation of reduce, reuse, recycle practice and teaching in schools. And we also really have to start looking at where is the best practice and make sure that's the standard practice. And then move on from there in terms of development and experimentation. At the present moment, in spite of the fact of the general environmental aims, the legislation and funding for a promotion of recycle and reduce, the educational aspect of it is extremely poor, it's inconsistent, and it's generally inadequate. And now, my petition, it, it focused upon, I think, was a key indicator, which was the provision of recycling facilities in school playgrounds. Now, if obviously there's enough waste produced to produce waste bins, uh, there should be, um, I would think, automatically a case for the, the deployment of recycling bins at the same time. Not having them sends a mixed message because it sort of undermines any message that um, this is a critical, that reduce, reuse, recycle is a critical issue. 
So it undermines that message. And also you're losing a really important opportunity to establish that mindset within young children. And you can see, sort of see the attitude, even if I came in here today to Edinburgh, I came on ScotRail, came by train, I went to Waverley Station. Now, commuting is a very high profile activity. It's a main element in many people's lives. But when you go to the our National Railway Station, um, there are no, no separate recycling bins. Apparently, it all goes in waste bins and it gets taken away and gets recycled, hand sorted. Even if that's the case, it's a very poor way of doing recycling. So we've got a failing there. And I think that's a reflection of the, the, the fact that if you go to school playground, a lot of school playgrounds don't have separate recycling facilities. They're linked. Uh, and I know, now I've discussed this issue with many people, no one has disagreed with me the fact that um, it's really important to, to get, you know, get that, develop that mentality at a young age. Nobody's disagreed with it. Um, there's also a considerable amount of evidence and experience that says that getting children involved in recycling is because of immediate effect and getting children changing adults' behaviour because our general recycling rate in Scotland is pretty appalling. So there's that. And there's also there's the point that doing, bringing recycling is actually probably a lot better way of developing anti-litter attitudes than just purely providing litter bins. I've never had any dissension from that at all. However, if you look at the situation within my, my, my area, which is Falkirk District, if you look at that, no one in Falkirk District, no one, including the education department, can tell which schools provide recycling bins and playgrounds and which ones don't. Far less being able to say, well, that's the best scheme and that's the best way to do it, this, all the schools should do it. No one can do that. I've also had quite a lot of discussions with people and it seemed to indicate in my area there's a limit on how much material schools can recycle. The relevant council department, it seems, I think it needs some serious investigation, it seems actually limits the amount of material that they, they will collect from schools. So they're actually technically limited. Um, I th that's, you know, a um, ridiculous situation. I think there's investigation, but I'm not entirely surprised because I've had similar comments from other people people in other areas of Scotland. And in fact, I'll hand out later, I've got some quotes here that I'll, I'll pass on to the committee that I've collected. So basically, I think it's got to the stage now that we need to bring the educational aspect of promoting reduced reuse recycle up to the same level with the legislation and funding. And I think it's letting the whole thing down. And essentially, that's my point with uh, the, the petition. And I just feel that, you know, we need some sort of mandatory standards. I have to look at it seriously because it's been badly neglected for a long time now. And I think this will be much better to put efforts into developing education and improving reduced re reuse recycling rates rather than investing in incineration, which will actually commit us to producing a lot of waste and won't actually solve the letter problem either. Well, thank you much for your uh, contribution, uh, Mr. Wells. I certainly uh, very strongly support a number of the aspects of things you've raised. And in my own experience, I uh, I went uh, a couple of years ago to uh, to Egg to, to see where they won one of the yeah, Eco School Awards, and I was really impressed with all the work, not just of one class, but the whole school seemed to be integrated into uh, very much the points that you're saying on, on recycling. Just a couple of points, and the first uh, in terms of legislation. My understanding is there is some legislation which I think will be fully enforced in 2014, where schools are required to do a lot more. Uh, work and very much echoing the points in your petition. Do you, do you feel that that legislation is sufficient and that schools should be doing a lot more uh, before 2014 to get up to, to scratch? Well, I mean, I haven't actually seen the legislation itself, but that's, I'm not that's encouraging that it's there. Um, I, it obviously depends if it's fully implemented and, you know, the, the standards are set and kept. It doesn't get watered down between now and 2014, but I definitely think there really has to be a big effort and before then and establishing uh, work with schools. I mean, you're quite right that some schools are doing a really good job, uh, some aren't. And I mean, there's some one feeling that something has been backed up by other people. At the moment, yes, some schools, some children are receiving an ed a decent education on it, but it's a lottery dependent on your school, your teachers and your local authority. And that's something, it's, 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 it's inconsistent. And I think they have to be, we have to make, I think the good schools at the moment are the exception, we have to make them the standard. And there certainly is a big difference. And I think this, the schools have to have set standards, but also if there's a technical problem that, that's being imposed on them, that has to be removed. And if there's any bureaucratic considerations, that has to be dealt with as well. So it's partly, yes, the schools need a push, 
but it's also things have to be made easier for the schools. But there are, unfortunately, I think sometimes the, the positive examples get used to obscure the problems with other schools. And that's happening quite a lot. We're having the examples that are held up, but they are the exceptions. Yeah. It's not standard. And I think to, sometimes it can be a wee, wee bit counterproductive. The other aspect I was going to raise with you, you may already have covered this, you probably know that the GTC um, are currently um, consulting on revised professional standards for teachers, and clearly issues to do with sustainability and recycling could be part of that. Is that something you've considered as part of your petition to contact the GTC? Um, I, I really haven't contacted GTC myself, I mean, it's something I'll consider. Um, interestingly, I've actually, one of the comments I've got in my paper was actually from a, a secondary school teacher who was quite critical about the school's attitude and the attitudes of some teachers towards reduce, reuse, recycle. He actually said that they're not setting a very good example. Um, and that's from a teacher, so I think it's got some validity. I, I think, yeah, um, I, I would say again, it's an issue that some teachers seem to take an issue quite seriously, seriously others don't. Although it's, part, it's actually part of the curriculum. Mm. This, uh, may, this may well be an area that uh, the committee wishes to contact the GTC about, but I'll leave that personally and perhaps bring in John Wilson to start with the question. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, uh, Mr Wallace. The, the issue, uh, I think, is quite rightly identified as an important issue for all of us. Uh, the questions I would want to ask you are around uh, the issue about... We have eco-schools in Scotland. Uh, now, the information we have as a committee before us says that uh, over th just under 4,000 schools are registered with Eco Schools in Scotland. Uh, there's 40% of those schools have achieved the Green Flag Award, and anybody who knows the Green Flag Award mm. system is in place. Do you think that scheme does enough to promote recycling in the schools? Because you know, it is a, a major event uh, when the school gets awarded a Green Flag. Uh, and I have my personal views about what the Green Flags are being awarded for, but I'd like to hear your views before I give my comments. Well, I mean, my, my, I've spoken to a few teachers about this, and I've also spoken to quite a few other people who do a lot of, uh, sort of work with schools, and that's including rangers and you know, people from uh, voluntary organisations who go into schools. And these things are quite often double-edged swords in the sense that, yes, they're an improvement at what, upon what was there. Having eco-schools, having a, a flag system, ha having standards, it's an improvement. But sometimes, yes, that brings things up, that drives things forward, but sometimes... Um, that simultaneously means some schools, they tick a few boxes and they leave it there. And the, the feedback I've had from quite a few people is a lot of schools, that, the schools are taking it so far, they're getting the wee boxes ticked to get their, their eco flag, the green flag, bronze award, whatever, they do, and they're not really pushing it beyond that. Um, and that's, some, that's um, I've had that from quite a few um, people, that, that comment that, yes, it's a good thing, but um, if you've got to be careful with things like that, because sometimes... Um, they can actually be used as an excuse not to take things further forward. And I think with some elements of environmental education, like other any education, they have to be standard and mandatory, and basically nothing to do with eco schools. They have to be there, whether a school is an eco school or not, whether it's what its award is, it should be part and parcel of the, the general educational package. And I think we've, you know, really something like recycling, it's got to be, whether or not school is anything to do with eco schools, it's got to be there. Um, and I actually spoke to, I dealt with somebody in KSB who runs eco schools about that, and I raised that issue. That I think it's not, you know, it's a step forward, but it's not everything. Um, and I know, you know, I, even I think where the have, schools have done well and they've got the flag, I think in a lot of cases maybe could do a wee bit more. The, uh, the view I was going to express is my understanding and what my experience of the eco school system was is about litter uh, and clearing up litter in the playgrounds seem to account for more than recycling. Uh, but the issue, and given that we have eco-schools uh, and we have the whole award system, would it not be preferable to actually tie that up into, that you've mentioned earlier, about a number of people like the Scottish Wildlife Trust. I know Jupiter and Grangemouth do a lot of work in uh, going out to community schools uh, and speaking to the community and bringing people into Jupiter uh, to actually show them what they do in terms of recycling. So would it not be better to actually do it through that process uh, and make it a wider community issue rather than just something that's taught in the school itself? Uh, because you can make it mandatory in school, mm. but the problem is, as I know from where I live, uh, kids just throw the rubbish in the street where, uh, because they see that their parents do it. So they think that's the norm. They don't put them in the rubbish in the bin. Uh, would it not be better, as I said, to actually make it more 
uh, inclusive in terms of a wider society issue rather than just in schools? Well, I think, that, I think, well, I think that's part of it. I mean, um, I mean, I've concentrated today on the, the with schools. I mean, I've concentrated on the schools element because I think that's the most critical area. And I, you know, for more than twenty years now, we've had curbside recycling in Scotland, and we're still not doing, you know, reaching the schools properly, in my opinion. So yeah, that's a general, you know, that's my specific point. But yes, generally, the um, generally the educational uh, work that's went to public has been very poor. And I, I you know, speaking to somebody who lives in the curbside recycling area, the information that's been given to me has not been great. The quality and quantity of information, I think, is quite derisory, actually. So, yes, and accompanying with working in the schools, you really have to look at the general package that goes out to public as well. They would complement each other. Obviously, if you've got children who are more effective at going out, they're getting their, children, their parents to look at reduce, reuse, recycle. If that's backed up with more general campaigning, I think, yes, you have to look at that. And I've got one wee example of what I mean here. Um, this was the leaflet that was given out to me by my local authority, and I think eight, nine, ten years ago, maybe now. And this was explaining they rolled out the three curbside bins. You know, a lot of you will be familiar with it: brown bin, blue bin, green bin. This was rolled out. This is the only actual information I can recall that the council's really given sent out about it. And this was sent out to me it's about eight years ago. It's an eight-page document. Now. Do you mind just reading out the title? So, for the record, we've got a note of what the leaflet says. You're right, certainly. It's um, Three Bend Curbside Recycling Guide, um, helping you to get it sorted. That's it. Um, it's quite old now. But that's an eight-page document. The reasons why, why you should actually participate in the curbside recycling scheme, that's it. It's two paragraphs in an eight-page document. And it starts off by saying... Why do we need to recycle our waste? New European laws have been passed that require the countries who are part of the European Union to lower the amount of waste that they send to landfill. That's the first paragraph. It's two paragraphs in the eight-page document telling the public why they should use the multi-million pound investment in capital recycling that the Council's run out. I don't think that's adequate in terms of either quantity of information or quality of information. And I think that has to be looked at. So I, I, I totally agree with you. There is a reason. There is need to expand the general message. They complement each other. Um, Angus McDonald. Okay. <coughs> Thank you, convener. Um, I, I think I should place on record that Mr. Wallace attended my surgery on uh, Friday eh, to discuss this issue and other issues within Falkirk District eh, regarding the environment. So just just for the record, um, I certainly have a lot of uh, sympathy with Mr. Wallace's petition, um, and I note in his. Um, submission, uh, his reference to the three R's, uh, reduce, reuse, recycle. Uh, and I was surprised, actually, to learn that there's no legal requirement in Scotland schools to uh, provide recycling facilities uh, within the playgrounds. Um, however, the new legislation should hopefully help uh, address that issue. Um, you, you made reference to a situation in 1989 when you started uh, dealing with uh, uh, recycling yourself. Um, Surely you recognise that there has been major improvements since then, um, not least in Falkirk, where uh, they have met their targets over a, a, a number of a recent years. Well, in terms of being improvement, there, there couldn't help being but being an improvement because um, we were actually doing some work now where when, when it got started in Scotland, effectively there was no work being done in schools. Um, so yes, in that sense, it is a big improvement. But I still feel that it's, it's better than it was, but it's not as good as it should be. I think the delivery is inconsistent across Scotland. I think it seems that local schools, local different authorities are taking different approaches. And I can't see how that's healthy or the best way of doing it. We really should look at best standard practice. And I certainly know from my own experience in environmental education, there's a considerable difference in... Um, for instance, when you're doing effective environmental education with children, whether or not physical recycling is part of that, that educational package. Um, and I actually worked at an uh, education centre in America, an internship, many years ago, where we spoke about reduce, reuse, recycle to the children, but they came in, we spoke about it, they went away, the schools were brought in. There was no actual element there of getting children physically involved in recycling at the school or whatever. And as far as I'm aware, it didn't make any difference. But I've also seen alternative, uh, been involved in alternative approaches where physical recycling was part of it, and the children it worked really well. There's a huge difference between how, how effective different forms of environmental education are. So, yes, we've went forward. We couldn't help to. But I still think we're way short of where we have to be. 
uh, is inconsistent. Um, uh, there are a lot of really good people who are involved. I mean, Jen Barrett in Falkirk District, who's an outstanding person, um, there's some su really superb people involved in local authorities who are doing this, but I think they're let down sometime, uh, with sometimes. And, I mean, J Jen Barrett's fantastic. She's been really helpful to myself and a lot of schools. So, yeah, they have good people working on it, but yeah, it's just like a chain. It's only as strong as its weakest link. And, uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of links in this that have to be dealt with. Have you shared the experiences that you um, saw in uh, America? Have you shared that with... Um Local authority officers. Well, yeah, I've spoken to quite. I've had. Um, I mean, I've spoke. I've spoke directly to quite a few people in the council, um, and I've spoke to a lot of teachers, and I've tried to share that that information as much as possible and take give it a, a wider platform. Um, I've certainly made a big point over the years saying that I think if you don't have um, the physical element, of actual recycling in a, an educational package, it doesn't really work very well, and that's something I think that really needs stressing. Um, because, I mean, children can become absolutely fanatical recyclers when they're actually involved in it at a young age. Um, and I actually know a, I know a kid who actually went and harassed his headmaster to, to improve the recycling in the school. And this headmaster had to put up with it because the kid was in the right. <laughs> so it's true. Um, but there's a big difference. Uh, and there doesn't seem to be much. We really need to look at what are the best forms available and, and have them made in the standard. Yes, big issue. Um, my colleague uh, John Wilson mentioned that over 40% of schools uh, have green flag status. Um, can you tell us if um, a green flag status, if the criteria for the green flag status requires schools to have recycling facilities in their playgrounds before they can get the green flag? I'm not quite certain. I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I do know that a lot... Um the school, one or two primary schools that I know, I don't think they've got the full green flag status and they don't have, um, they don't have as far as I'm aware, the recycling facilities in the playground. I do know that a lot of schools in Falkland District appear not to have recycling facilities in the playground. If they're the same ones that don't have a green flag, then I would, I would imagine that must be a criteria. Uh, but I certainly know in that case that the eco-schools hasn't been quite enough a bigger driver to make that the standard feature in schools, having recycling facilities in the playground. So it's at the moment it's you know some schools obviously got um, you know but uh, I mean some schools obviously they've got higher eco school status than others so again there's an inconsistency there a wee bit um, and I, again my concern is I th yeah I think eco schools is great but it's not a substitute for for mandatory standards I think. Hey, back in. Briefly, I'm a little bit short of time. Okay, um, just you mentioned in your preamble um, the issue of institutional apathy. What would you do to deal with institutional apathy? Well, I think basically you've got to set men, uh, uh, you've got to be mentally standards, and there's got to be uh, there can't be a situation where you have where certain people in certain departments or local authority can throw a spanner in the works for other people. Basically, um, I mean, I know from my own situation. I'll give you one example in Falkirk District. I was at a recycling management committee meeting, and this is 1995. Kerbside Recycling had been gone Falkirk for six years by then. There was a senior member of one of the council departments at that table, and they actually argued against putting efforts into uh, efforts into putting educational work on reduced reuse recycling in schools because they felt it was more of a priority to talk about litter issues. And when I pointed out to them, well, they're the same thing. It's not a case of one or the other. They've got the same issue. They then went on to say, well... Um, Oh, but, but you know, it's too. You just have to look at the schools and how reluctant they are to use bins. It's a waste of time. So basically, it was just procrastination to do nothing. And there's a great deal. Of, uh, there's still, I think, an attitude in some quarters that recycling is an obligation at best. And I think there's not quite the level of commitment in some areas that there needs to be. Um, Thank you for that. Sorry, I'm a little bit short of time. We've still sir. three other questions. Could I ask for short questions and perhaps short answers? Thank you, Jackson Carlo. To the second part of your petition, please, in which you call for a national survey to be undertaken. Who would complete and undertake this survey? What form would it take? Who would compile the information that it produced and to what effect? What would be done with it and in what format? How much would this cost and from where would this cost be met? Uh, well, uh, my, my idea would be a very comprehensive survey. It would be conducted by a wide range of partners, including uh, people from local authorities, people from central government, uh, non-governmental organisations, uh, educational authorities. So it would be a very 
very comprehensive um, survey. It would look into a multitude of issues. Uh, they would conduct it. Um, it would be They'd also, would hopefully, I think, and I was speaking to somebody about this other week, I think you'd also have to perhaps look outside Scotland, for example, as a really effective environmental education outside the country that perhaps could be replicated here. So that would be established. Uh, that would be conducted. Um, it would be compiled. Information would be compiled pretty much the way any other survey would be, I would imagine, uh, professionally. Some of the information, you could quantify it numerically. Some, you wouldn't. It would be cases of it down to statements. As far as, the, as far as the cost goes, well, yes, there would be up cost. I can't give you a cost. It's not my field. But I do know that I think the, the cost, I think the benefits are considerably higher than any cost because if it means we can get a higher standard of uh, environment, environmental education and information to make our existing infrastructure re recycling work more effectively, I think the cost, um, I think the, the cost of it will be minimal compared to the benefits. And I'll give you one example. In my local authority in Falkirk, we have actually got one of the better recycling uh, rates in the whole of Scotland, one of the best. However, we also have one of the most comprehensive curbside recycling schemes in the whole of Scotland. And it's been established for a good few years now. However, uh, they did a waste analysis in Falkirk some years ago, and they found that almost half the material that's still going in the green bin it was recyclable or compostable. And it's estimated that in Falkirk District, £1.2 million pounds is being spent by the council on landfill tax just because people are not using the recycling and composting facilities they already have. And there's actually, there actually my local authority is actually considering, somebody, some people are considering a scheme whereby half the savings, if, if you can get a community to, to, to increase the recycling and composting rate, half the savings from that will go back into the local authority because there's such a desperation to reduce the, to, to improve the infrastructure the way the infrastructure is used. So I think, I mean, you know, I think a survey, the cost would be minimal compared to any potential benefits. Jackson Carlo. Uh, Adam Ingram. Hi, thank you, convener. Um, I was interested uh, to obviously hear, hear your petition. Um, I wondered what evidence you had uh, that um, there was institutional apathy across the country there was uh, a shortfall, if you like, in performance of schools. Um, because I would have thought, with the advent of the Eco Schools um, uh, program, and I've certainly visited more than a few schools myself where children and teachers are very enthusiastic in picking up all the various elements of the, the Eco School uh, a, a idea, uh, that we've moved very dramatically over the last 20 years to, to improve matters in, in terms of environmental consciousness of the reduce, reuse, recycle mantra. Well, we've, we've certainly moved, as a, to repeat a point, yes, we've certainly moved considerably forward because that which was comparatively easy to do because you start from nothing. I mean, I, I mean 20, when I started in Kerbs of Recycling in 1989, my organisation I worked for which was environmental charity, that's why they had the money. They had absolutely no plans or interest in developing environmental education in schools, which was a disgrace. And it took about seven or eight years for to have an office in place. Uh, sorry for interrupting, but that was then. This is now. Still we're, relevant. We've moved very significantly uh, further forward. So, you know, where's your evidence that was... there is a significant problem here? Right, well, we've moved significantly further forward. We're still way behind where we, we need to be. And as far as my evidence goes, well, why have some schools got... Some seem to have recycling facilities in the school playgrounds and some others not. Now, that's, a very, I think, a very key indicator about an element of de delivering effective environmental education. But why is it some schools have it and some don't? And as far as we, you know, we've moved forward, uh, maybe, but we've still got a massive problem with litter dumping. And that hasn't eased. And I can't see... Uh, recycling rates aren't that great. There's still a huge problem with children dropping litter and parents dropping litter as well. So although, yes, we've moved forward, it's not far enough. And I think elements of eco-school, we have to move from being involved with eco-schools to become a set standard within schools, outside of eco-schools. And that's a point I've made to keep Scotland beautiful as well. Um, and I mean, as well, you know, and I'll, as I say, I've got this information, these quotes I'll pass around to you at the end. And I think, you, you know, these are um, hopefully give back some of the points up. But I think, I mean, I think it would be danger of maybe, you know, 
may be deluding ourselves if we think eco schools are great, but it's not enough. And it's, yes, it's a very valuable, very step forward, step forward, but it isn't enough. I have time for one quick question. Can I'm a target? Quick point here. I welcome your your petition, Mr. Wallace. It, um, it's been extremely good. But also uh, the importance of the media within. I know we've kind of focused on schools and education, but I, I know from, from my own experience, the Glasgow Evening Times, the Clean Up Your Streets project, and how much involvement that's created with um, the community, as well as emphasising what is happening in, within the nursery schools, the primary schools, and the secondary schools. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of good. Um, there's a lot of good work done. Um, there is a lot of good work done, but I mean, I, I was speaking to somebody last night actually, and it was a, a grandmother, and she said her child, she's got grandchildren, she says they know about things, they know about reduce, reuse, recycle, they know about fair trade, they don't actually apply it. They'll buy fair trade coffee to please her, but they don't buy it themselves. They don't chuck litter down the street, but they don't do reduce, reuse, recycle. They know about these things, but it's not quite the same as getting them involved. There's a big difference where it applies. I think there's inconsistencies as well. Obviously, we have a huge litter problem in Scotland, but in, quite often the litter and fly tipping issues are treated as a separate issue from reduce, reuse, recycle. They're treated as separate issues, sometimes even conflicting issues. And I think there's a wee bit of inconsistency there. I was doing a, a, a litter pickup on Saturday, and what we did was we tried to, in, in, within the litter pickup, we tried to do reduce, reuse, recycle. We tried to re divert material to, fr away from landfill to, to recycling, which we're quite successful with. Uh, I'm sorry, cutting you short, uh, Mr. Wells. Can I, um, can I thank you very much for the evidence? If you just um, stay where we are in the meantime, we still have to decide the next steps. And thank you for your comprehensive answers as well. That's been very, very useful. Um, I'm now going to ask the committee to look at next steps. My own view is certainly this is a very good petition that we should certainly continue and write to um, Scottish Government for their views, particularly on the Waste Scotland Regulations 2012 we mentioned. Uh, John Wilson. Convener, I also agree we should continue with this petition, and I think, as well as writing to the Scottish Government, I think we should write to COSLA as well to find out what measures COSLA are taking to ensure we reach the targets that have been set. But I think there's also a number of other organisations that would be useful to uh, contact. That would be Zero Waste Scotland, Eco School Scotland, and the General Teaching Council for Scotland, uh, just seeking what their views are on the petition and what action they're taking to ensure the whole issue of recycling in schools is being addressed and whether or not it's part of the eco-schools uh, strategy to ensure recycling is there. I'd also suggest, convener, given that the petitioners made reference, extensive reference to Falkirk Council, that we write to Falkirk Council and ask them their views on this petition as well, uh, because I think it's only by right if you're mm. making reference to a local authority, they have the right to respond to the issues that have been raised Th by the petitioner. Thank you for that. I am Adam Ingram. In addition to that, I think we should write to Education Scotland. They are, after all, the inspectorate of, of the schools, and we might get some feedback on how the eco, um, the eco school uh, programme has rolled yeah. out and uh, yeah, get some feedback idea. on yeah. Thank you. Uh, Any other member have any additional comments? Angus, McDonald. With regard to writing to the General Teaching Council for Scotland, we should ask them. <coughs> Excuse me, we should ask them when they expect the outcome of their consultation to be made available. Any additional comments? Are members happy with that course of action? Okay. That's agreed. Thank you for that. And can I thank you again, Mr. Wells, for coming along, um, for giving evidence, and for replying to our questions uh, in such a comprehensive way. And uh, obviously, we'll keep you up to date with all the developments uh, on your petition. Thank you again for coming along. And I'll suspend for two minutes to allow uh, Mr. Wells to leave and for the Minister to take her place.
continue the meeting. Um, I, agenda item three is PE 1367 on banning mosquito devices. Uh, the next item of business is oral evidence on banning mosquito devices. Members have a note by the clerk, uh, paper one referred. Could I welcome our witnesses today? You're very welcome, Minister. Uh, Rosanna Cunningham, Minister for Community Safety and Legal Affairs, and John Brownlee, who's the Policy Man Manager for Community Safety Unit for the Scottish Government. Uh, Minister, can I invite you to make a short opening statement. Uh, I'll follow up with some specific questions, and my colleagues in turn will ask a number of other questions. And uh, we're very grateful for you giving up your time and coming along to address the committee today. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. Can I uh, thank you for the invitation uh, and can I commend the committee for the significant work that it's done in drawing out views on this issue. Uh, I, I think you've been dealing with this as a committee for over two years, uh, although I appreciate that uh, the personnel um, of the committee has probably changed in that intervening period. Um, I also want to say I'm impressed by the way in which the petitioner has expressed his arguments. I think he's been constructive and uh, intelligent. Um, and uh, uh, the petition uh, uh, is called Ban Mosquito Devices Now. Uh, so in those circumstances, it might be useful for me just to give uh, a little explanation on the record uh, of what is involved in the legislative process, such as that which could be required to regulate or ban the use of the device. Uh, as members know, legislating is not a quick and easy option uh, to address any problem and really should only be used as a last resort. Any decision to legislate should also follow the principles of better regulation. It should be proportionate uh, to the extent of any perceived problem. And we should also always look to see if the same outcome could be achieved through means other than legislation. There does need to be policy justification based on good evidence that, the, uh, that would be scrutinised during the parliamentary processes. And that justification might also need to stand up to scrutiny from the courts and others should any challenge be made. In short, the evidence as to the extent of the problem helps us judge whether or not a particular course of action might be appropriate or not. Fergus Ewing was clear when he appeared before the committee in March 2011. Uh, the Scottish Government does not support and has never supported the use of these devices. Our 2009 framework for tackling antisocial behaviour promoting positive outcomes, recognise that prevention and early and effective intervention and diversion should be at its heart. This is not just the Scottish Government's approach. Uh, this approach is shared by all those who have a role to play in tackling antisocial behaviour, and it's supported by local authorities, by the police, by Youth Link Scotland, by Action for Children Scotland and others. Um, uh, it's an approach that those tasked with tackling antisocial behaviour uh, support. Uh, following the committee's considerable efforts, however, it is clear that there are a number of very strong opinions. I would suggest, however, that there remains little indication of a widespread problem with use of this device, nor evidence of the device being used inappropriately in Scotland. And this is, I would suggest, crucial for concrete proposals to be formulated. Irrespective of how any ban was to be implemented, Evidence as to the extent of its use would be necessary to satisfy the Parliament and perhaps the courts and others that action of this nature was indeed appropriate, proportionate and targeted. Fergus Ewing previously outlined to the committee the limited evidence as to the extent of the use of the device across Scotland and it would seem to me that it might be difficult to achieve any response which could be considered proportionate given that limited information. Uh, I do think it worth highlighting, however, a notable success that this committee has realised in considering this petition. On 21st February 2012, the inventor of the device advised that he was happy to include a warning sign for devices sold to organisations in Scotland and that display of the sign would be included in the instructions for the device. I see that the manufacturer's website now makes clear devices being shipped to Scotland will come with such a warning sign. And that is a significant achievement and I do congratulate the committee and petitioner uh, on it. Uh, as I've said already, prevention and diversion are at the heart of our approach to tackling antisocial behaviour, and I'm sure the committee uh, will already be well aware of a number of the initiatives that are being undertaken uh, uh, by this government, so I won't uh, 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 go through a, a long list of them. If there was a widespread problem with the mosquito device, then I would expect to be approached, for example, through my own constituency office or through the ministerial uh, office or other, other avenues with people bringing examples to my attention. And, and that simply has not happened. Equally, I think that the sustained profile that the committee has given to this issue would have resulted in complaints being raised 
as awareness of the petition grew. But again, that doesn't appear to be happening. Um, given the lack of evidence as to the extent of any perceived problem, I don't think I could justify further work on this issue, which diverts us from priority work currently being taken forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Minister, for your very full statement. As you say, this has been an issue of great interest to the committee, and I'd like to again thank you for coming along. I'd particularly like to thank the Scottish Youth Parliament, who really have taken a tremendous initiative in this area, and certainly they were highly concerned about the issue, and I know some of my colleagues will be picking up on some of the points they've raised. Can I um, touch on a couple of um, points so we're absolutely clear uh, about the Scottish Government's role? The first is... Do you have the power to ban mosquito devices, if you so wished? Well, there does seem to be a little bit of a question mark over uh, uh, the Parliament's uh, competency uh, on this, but I haven't been able to establish, uh, 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 to my satisfaction, whether or not it would definitely be the case, and that's something that would require uh, to be tested. Um, uh, the issue is, uh, is complex and that... Uh, in those circumstances, uh, I can't give you a definite yes or no answer to that, other than to say uh, that there is a bit of a question mark over that uh, legislative competency. It would, competency. It would have to be the very first thing uh, that we did try to, uh, to establish for certain if a decision was made that, in principle, this would be a way we would wish to go. Uh, um, but at the moment, as I've indicated, we, we are not um, uh, of that view. Well, thank you, Mr. Ha on follow-up from that, then, ha have you sought specific legal advice to determine if you have the power to ban the devices? Uh, no, I think the answer is that we haven't actually uh, uh, formally put forward any uh, uh, request for a decision uh, on that basis, simply because at the moment we, we have no, there's no concrete proposal that, that we would be putting forward for such uh, advice, and you would only be asking it in extraordinarily general terms. Hmm. Uh, is it possible, Minister, then, particularly because of the interest uh, shown by this committee and the Scottish Youth Parliament, that you could ask specific legal advice to see whether the Scottish Government has the power uh, to ban mosquito devices? Well, I mean, we can put forward a, I mean, a, a general question, but the danger is you will just get a very general answer that says it depends on <laughs> what we're proposing. So, I, I, I mean, I can, I can ask the question... Uh, 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 but without a detailed proposal, the answer, I'm, I'm not sure what the answer would then be particularly worth. That's, it, it, I appreciate it's a bit chicken and egg, but that's where we usually are. Yeah. With, uh, uh, and, and it would be a question uh, of asking, if I'm right, uh, the Scottish Parliament uh, uh, legal advisers about the vires of this not necessarily the Scottish Government legal advisers, but I'll need to, I'll, I'll, I'll need to just uh, I'll need to clarify that. But nevertheless, Minister, you've been very honest about the complexity of this and the vagueness of this, but we would certainly appreciate, I think, getting something specifically back in terms of legal advice. I should have said, Mr Burnley, please feel free to intervene any time if you wish to add any comments. No I'll call him in if yeah, I need him. <laughs> yeah. I see he's not very reluctant to come in, so that's fine, I'll move on. Um, <laughs> Then my next question, ha have you, Minister, met with Home Office Ministers to discuss a ban or any crossover issues at all? No. Right. We, we have, as you know, had a, a letter back from Jeremy Brown, the Minister, uh, in fairly general terms. But I just wanted to clarify whether you... Had specific, I mean, this goes back to the question of committing resources to, to this. Uh, uh, and uh, at this stage, we've not really seen that it's necessary to... Uh, to do that, uh, you know, uh, I mean, th there's no bar on me having that conversation, but again, it would be in such very general terms, it is difficult to see how useful it would be, because my guess is that the, the response to that would be, as it would be if it was the other way around, well, you, you'll need to show me the specific thing that you're proposing to do, uh, and we're not minded to do it, which is the kind of slightly chicken and egg situation that we're in here. Do you have um, a, a, a sort of regular meetings with your Home Office uh, equivalent no. ministers? Right. And do you have any joint ministerial committees where there's a crossover with Home Office or Community Safety or Legal Affairs I've, officials? As a minister, uh, I've no. We, we correspond on specific issues hmm. as and when they might arise, but we don't have a general clearinghouse uh, conversation. Oh. Uh, I, you know. 
I go to Brussels, but I don't go to London. All oh, right. It right. doesn't. Well, it's partly because justice, as you would, you know, expect, is 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 pretty much all devolved. There, there is only a, a few occasions when it's necessary to correspond with MOJ officials, um, and uh, again. Uh, those occasions are driven by specifics rather than generalities. Just, uh, I mean, I understand that point, and again, you'd be very honest about that. I mean, wh why would the discussion with Home Office have to be in general terms? Why could it not be specifically about, we've had concerns from our parliamentary committee, we wish to look to see if we can ban mosquito devices. What? Why not be specific? Because we don't wish to look, to, we don't believe that banning mosquito devices is the way forward. We, we're not... As a government, you know, while we, oh, right. while, we, while we look at all the evidence that comes in, it simply doesn't stack up to enough for us as a government uh, to wish to go down the legislative route uh, of banning these devices. I mean, the Parliament has been here before banning things when there really was neither, you know, much in the way of evidence nor practical examples that you could point to. Uh, 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 that would need that ban and you know you're, it does mean committing resources uh, right from the get-go to something which frankly in my view is not evidenced uh, sufficiently to justify a legislative course of action. I know it's always dangerous Mr bringing in someone's predecessor but certainly Fergus Ewing gave fer fairly blunt evidence to us in the previous session about the Scottish Government's unhappiness about mosquito devices. I certainly took the inference there. There was a move towards looking at banning these devices. Well, I, you know, I, but, but, that's, but that's to equate, you know, an unhappiness with the use of the devices to, you know, going all the way through to legislating against them. And, and the fact of the matter is that the evidence that we have simply doesn't stack up sufficiently uh, to say that this is a problem which requires the the big guns of legislative uh, uh, change. Now, you know, if the evidence changes, then, uh, uh, then that may uh, result a, in a change of view on the part of government. But at, as at present, and as currently uh, uh, evidenced, uh, it would be difficult to justify a legislative solution. Uh, and, uh, you know, that is, it, that is not to say that we think it is the right thing to do. There, there are a great many things I don't think are the right thing to do, but we can't legislate to ban every single one of them uh, um, uh, unless there is actually evidence that that is, uh, that is a way forward. I'd like to bring my colleagues in now, because I'm conscious of time, and I know my colleagues have all got uh, a number of aspects I want to raise. Could start with John Bulls. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Minister. Uh, the Convener has already uh, made reference to the evidence session we had with uh, Fergus Ewing when he was the minister dealing with this issue and the, can I just <coughs> basically give some indication that my understanding and I'm one of those members of this committee that's actually straddled both the last session and this session uh, continuous membership of this committee uh, for almost five years the, the issue for me is the one whereby my understanding that of the commitment we got from the previous minister was that he would certainly enter into dialogue, uh, potentially with the UK government, to look at how we can actually act in a UK-wide uh, initiative to try and look at the use of these mosquito devices. Because clearly, while this petition came in from Andrew Deans on behalf of the Scottish Youth Parliament, uh, we've heard evidence throughout the sessions from various organisations, including the National Artistic Society, which has clearly claimed that this is a discriminatory uh, use of a device against certain uh, sections of the community. And it's really the, the current legislation, as I understand it, can be taken to ban the use of these devices is under the Environmental Protection Act 1990, which is a piece of UK legislation. And can I clarify from you, Minister, whether or not that piece of legislation, as far as you're aware, is still in place? Yes. Um, Yes, that, that was um, certainly part of the discussion when Fergus Ewing was in front of the committee. Um, I believe it was Cathy Craigie who had asked the question at the time around about the noise nuisance provisions. Um, our understanding is that using those provisions would not result in a, a nationwide ban. I mean, as, as far as I'm aware, they're still in place. They can still be used, um, but they're very much dependent on the circumstances. So, for example, if somebody was to investigate a complaint under that, then they would go along and they would measure how loud it was, how long it was on for, whereabouts it was located, where it was being heard, that kind of thing. It's, it's very much dependent on the circumstances of, of where the actual device is. 
Um, to answer your first point um, in terms of dialogue with UK government, um, Fergus Ewing did give a commitment that he would, um, that should any meeting come up between himself and, and um, colleagues down south, that the mosquito would be put on the agenda. Um, what happened later that year, as I think I've outlined in previous letters to the committee, is that uh, myself and a number of my colleagues um, went down to London to discuss antisocial behaviour measures um, with colleagues from the Home Office. Um, and that was fed back to the committee, and I think that's um, reflected also in the letter from uh, Jeremy Brown, MP. Here, the, what, where I'm trying to get to is a position whereby is the Scottish Government prepared to give any clear guidance to local authorities uh, in relation to the use of those devices within local authority areas? Because when we've contacted uh, COSLA, and the last response we received from uh, COSLA was one whereby they have effectively referred us back to the Scottish Government. Uh, and I would ask the Minister uh, and Mr Brownlee whether or not there has been any discussion with COSLA or local authorities about the use of mosquito devices within the local authority areas and what action these local authorities can take to actually prohibit the use of those mosquito devices. I have personally, as a minister, not been involved in any such discussions. That doesn't necessarily mean that there haven't been some conversations, and I do understand that there is practitioner guidance which is available to local authorities, but the extent uh, to which that covers the concerns that you're raising, I, I, I couldn't speak to. Um, uh, uh, as far as I'm aware, at the moment, local authorities uh, are capable, and I think what John Brownlee is suggesting is that they... The, the UK legislation that, that dates from 1990 does allow uh, a local authority uh, uh, does allow local authority action if there is a specific uh, complaint raised uh, uh, to them, um, and it will be dealt with under what are generically known as the noise nuisance laws, uh, which uh, currently are a matter entirely for individual local authorities. And local authority practice is not uniform. It will change from area to area, and it will be in response to uh, what they have flagged up to them uh, as a serious issue. Um, I know that I do have some figures in here, and I'll have a look for them just about the, the actual numbers of local authorities that have registered that there is a question, but, it's, but it is very small, and it goes back to the issue of there simply not being um, a, a body of evidence that suggests that this this is flagging itself up as a significant problem, uh, and uh, and we're then back to um, uh, we're back to the um, uh, question of whether, on the basis of that lack of evidence, uh, uh, moves towards clearing the way for legislation are an appropriate use of government resources. Um, we, we did uh, 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 there is there is some information from local authorities. Uh, I'm not sure if the committee has this. Um, which is uh, um, uh, of 32 local authorities, we, there were responses uh, uh, from 20, uh, and uh, I'm not sure, is this from the Scottish Youth Parliament? Um, uh, and, did that. Uh, no, the, the government did this. Um, 20 uh, local authorities are aware of the, uh, of the existence of mosquito devices, um, six uh, indicated that they were aware of it being used in their area, but that was in three cases was historical rather than current. Um, uh, uh, ten indicated that they were not aware of it being used uh, and four of them didn't answer. Uh, uh, three local authorities have expressed a public view. Again, you know, that means that uh, while 20 local authorities are aware of the existence of the device, only three felt it you know, issuing a public view was appropriate. Um, seven said they hadn't and there was no answer from ten. And only one local authority said that any concerns had been expressed to them. I, I, again, I come back to the fact that there simply doesn't appear to me to be the kind of groundswell of evidence that you would need to begin to make the moves towards uh, uh, considering legislation in an area. Minister, could I just seek clarification? When was that consultation carried out? And uh, let me just check. What's the date here? I'm being advised March 2011, so March 2011. it's within the last 
two years. The reason why I've asked that question, Minister, is that you're quite rightly identified in your opening statement that the manufacturer uh, of the mosquito device, when he gave evidence earlier this year, indicated that he would send out a cautionary note with the device to anyone who decided to install it. Now, up until that point, it was difficult to determine whether or not mosquito devices were being used by shopkeepers and others. We heard an evidence that we, there was suspicion that even private residents were using the mosquito device to deter young people from hanging about uh, outside their houses and in lanes round about their houses. With the cautionary note and the poster that's going to go up if the purchasers of the device decide to put the poster up, then it will become more evident the device is being used. It's been very difficult, and I, and I think your consultation responses clearly indicated it's difficult for local authorities to know who is actually using the device because there was no need to really register the device and the use of the device by any shopkeeper, uh, you no know, individual uh, citizen who was using the device. How do we get round the issue of identifying where the devices are being used and the nuisance and, and cause that has, particularly given the evidence we heard not only from the National Autistic Society but from individuals with young children, particularly young children under the age of three, four, mm -hmm. who could be potentially affected by the use of mosquito devices uh, in uh, shopping malls and other areas. How do, we get, how do we get to a position where we know who's actually using these devices? I think in the, in the first instance, uh, uh, obviously uh, uh, it may be that some people are using them and it's not widely known that they are doing so. But, you know, and I can only speak from personal experience here as an MSP, I get many, many, many complaints about groups of young people uh, hanging around and the general suspicion is that they're up to no good when in actual fact most of them are not doing anything at all. Uh, I've never yet, not once, ever had a complaint from uh, a, a young person about uh, uh, there being an indication that, uh, uh, that somebody was using this technology to prevent people hanging about. Now, you know, I, I appreciate what you're saying about uh, very small children probably not being able to articulate those concerns, but uh, the, the point about these devices is that they are audible uh, to up to, what, late teens, early 20s, um, and I've, I've, I'm simply not aware of there being any uh, complaints or evidence that they are being widely used. And on the very few number of occasions where, on the basis of that evidence, one might assume they may be used, it still doesn't amount to me uh, to a case for legislating uh, against their use. Because it doesn't, there isn't any evidence at all that they are being used uh, uh, in anything uh, like, to anything like the extent uh, uh, that uh, uh, the concerns are being expressed about. Thank you, Minister. Uh, just before I bring in uh, Anne Matargat, um, is it possible you could send us that uh, survey that you mentioned earlier, Minister? Uh, yeah. And wh why was the views of local authorities sought at that stage? Because you, I think you indicated earlier that you're not wishing to ban the devices, why then was the survey carried out? Uh, I think it would just have been as, a, as an attempt to, to gather useful evidence in the ongoing mm. conversation, particularly with the petitions committee. We would need to know, uh, to, give, to get some sense ourselves as to whether or not uh, 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 there might be evidence out there uh, about it being widespread and the immediate first port of call for such evidence. Uh, would be the local authorities themselves because they are the bodies yeah. responsible for noise and nuisance issues. Sure, I understand that. Obviously, in terms of whether local authorities are aware of them, we would obviously need to overlay the actual sales figures of mosquito devices because some local authorities won't have any mosquito devices in their local authority areas. But certainly, as I said, the Youth Parliament are in no doubt that this is a problem area. So for us, that's the evidence uh, of the concern because they're, they're obviously a democratic Scotland wide body that have. I understand that, but, yeah. but you know. It, it basically does come down to whether or not what we have is sufficient uh, to mandate uh, uh, government and parliamentary resources on legislation, uh, which is, if you like, the nuclear option in terms of, uh, uh, of any activity um, uh, that we might wish to, uh, uh, wish to see change. Anne Matagra. Good morning, Minister. Thanks, convener. 
given um, within our own constituencies, um, within our own areas, we do particularly find that young people don't come along to complain about what's happening within their area in, in general. Um, and obviously taking on board the Scottish Youth Parliament as, as their evidence, would, do you think that the Scottish Government would be doing anything different if this was affecting elderly people? I think I would still be asking for, for evidence. I mean, I would still be looking for evidence that this is a significant problem. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, the occasional random uh, uh, bit of reporting, you know, if, if that was to mandate legislation in every case on every issue, uh, we would be constantly doing so in this Parliament. And, and that can't be a way forward for, for the Parliament. And I do you know, want to reference back on occasions when this Parliament has done that kind of legislating. And I can tell you uh, that the opprobrium that it attracts is massive, uh, because effectively what you're doing is to legislate uh, against something which either it doesn't exist or exists in such tiny numbers that going to legislation to deal with it looks like you know, using a, a, a nuclear bomb to crack a nut. Uh, and I, I just want to come back to that, that this is about evidence. Now, if any group of people is, is, uh, is seriously impacted by any activity, then uh, they do have the capacity to, uh, uh, to in ensure that that is brought forward to government and to parliament, and then we will always look carefully at the evidence and consider whether or not legislation is appropriate. Uh, uh, but at the moment, given the information that we have about this particular issue, uh, it is our view that legislation, you know, is not justified at this stage. Would the Minister be willing for, to meet the, the Scottish Youth Parliament for to discuss the issue further, given that they have grave concerns and have brought this petition to the petition? I'm always Committee. available to meet with people. Uh, and organisations who are raising issues that are within uh, uh, my portfolio remit. And I would be very happy to meet with them if they wish to come uh, and speak to me. Uh, Angus MacDonald. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Convener. Um, good morning, Minister. Um, the Convener mentioned uh, uh, the, the reply from the Home Office Minister for Crime Prevention, um, uh, Jeremy Brown. Uh, and there seems to be little appetite from the Home Office in London towards uh, prohibition of the mosquito device. Uh, however, they have noted uh, public concerns and state that the legal position is uh, kept under review. Um, given that uh, the Scottish Government has consulted with local authorities last year, as, as you, you, you mentioned earlier, can I, ask them, can I ask you, Minister, whether the Scottish Government has sought advice on any ECHR implications, or did you, have you not got to that stage? Um, well, we do have, uh, I mean, obviously we have to consider ECHR implications in whatever we do uh, and uh, however uh, we, want to, uh, we want to proceed. Um, uh, the ECHR does uh, uh, regulate interference by the state and state authorities with the rights of individuals and the Human Rights Act. Uh, and uh, uh, public authorities can't act incompatibly with the Convention. Uh, but as I understand it, um, the use of this device is not a breach of ECHR uh, and there doesn't, as I said, appear to be sufficient evidence of harm to justify our intervention. Uh, and that justification uh, for intervention would equally have to be made uh, by us uh, in terms of ECHR. ECHR, in a sense, would cover both sides of this equation. Mm -hmm. I'll bring Angus MacDonald back in. Um, further to my earlier points, have you sought specific legal advice to confirm whether mosquito devices are a breach or not of ECHR? Well, you know, what we have, uh, uh, what we, the information that we have is that the use of devices by private individuals or companies is not a breach of ECHR. Now, uh, uh, as I think every member knows, uh, trying to prejudge what ultimately might be considered a breach is something that uh, is... Is, is probably in its specifics beyond every single one of us. But the best advice we have is that it is not uh, that the use of these is not a breach of, of human rights. And, and in a sense, you know, uh, uh, um, that there is another side to that. And I, I'm just making the point that, that ECHR doesn't just regulate one side of the issue, it regulates all of it. 
Uh, and uh, um, I, I would anticipate that there might equally be an argument from the other side of things as well if we tried to interfere. So, um, you know, the, 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 our, our, our advice is at the moment that using them is not a breach. They would need to test that in a court, yeah. find out whether or not uh, it was true. And, and you know, at, at a UK-wide level, there's been no test of that. Sorry, I'm making heavy weather this, Mr. Because just so the committee is absolutely clear on this. I mean, have you sought specific legal advice on these CHR issues, mosquito devices, or is this informal uh, advice you're getting from your own officials? Um, and are these officials qualified in European law? Well, you know, it comes back to the extent to which, as a government, we're going to expend resources on this. The Equality and Human Rights Commission stated that it had no fully defined position on the issue. Uh, 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 and that's the Equality and Human Rights Commission. So, I mean, I, I, you know, I'm going by the best advice that we have in general terms. We haven't specifically formulated a specific question to the lawyers about ECHR any more than we have uh, uh, about the other issues that we talked about earlier. Uh, but that's because at present we have no specific intention to legislate. Uh, you know, we, we kind of go slightly round in circles here. Uh, uh, because without a specific intention to legislate, there's no specific question to put to lawyers and to uh, 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 either about competency no. or about yeah. ECHR. No, I mean, I think, Minister, that's very clear. I mean, there, there clearly was a number of issues before we took evidence today that we wished to get to the bottom of. You, you, in fact, have made it clear the government doesn't wish to ban the devices and you've given a general account of the advice that you've been given. That's where the committee wanted to clarify. So thank you for that. I'll bring in uh, Adam Ingram. Yeah, uh, I, I would just like, uh, Minister, if you could confirm that irresponsible use of the mosquito device, however that is defined, is covered by an appropriate regulatory regime. Um, can you, can you clarify well, any, that? Anything that involves the use of noise, however it's constituted, would be uh, a, able to be covered by uh, local authorities through their noise nuisance uh, and the environmental health departments. Uh, and we're not seeing that. that I think that's the, the, the point. Uh, uh, and only at the point at which a local authority felt that that was not a functioning ability, way to, to move forward presumably at that point local authorities would begin to ask us uh, uh, to reconsider the position, but we're not there at all, no, nowhere near that. Um, and uh, I'm not even conscious that any local authority has, has attempted or, or required to progress anything through its own noise nuisance uh, 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 departments, um, um, most yeah. of which are dealt with on a very you know, informal basis that just involves kind of getting people to behave. So, uh, essentially, you haven't had any or any volume at all of complaints no, or, or, or of a problem being flagged up by local no. authorities that there, <coughs> this is an issue that they have... The, nothing. They're not dealing with. Nothing. Okay. Thank you. Now, that may be because they've had nothing flagged up to them and are not actually no. using the noise nuisance, uh, don't require to, but they are there as, if you like, a first stop in terms of handling this um, and, uh, and there is absolutely no indication that that has been necessary. It's just a, there, there may be an issue here. If, if, the, if it's a hidden problem to, to some degree that you can't, it's not been identified and it's not being reported, there is actually an issue, but it's not being reported. Um, I just wondered if the, if the actual regulatory regime was in, in a kind of shape that could deal with it, um, a responsible use of the mosquito device. Um, it, it might be helpful um, to the committee. I'm, I'm sure it remembers um, when Fergus Ewing attended and there was the discussion around the noise nuisance provisions. And one of the questions that was asked was um, whether a form of test purchasing, as it was described, um, would, would be a way forward. And as I understand it, if a young person is to make a complaint, this would involve the, um, the noise team actually taking along another young person to verify that there is, in fact, a sound there. Um, and I, I discussed this with a noise nuisance team leader who said there is certainly nothing that would prevent this from happening. But equally, um, he was keen to point out that a properly calibrated sound meter may in fact pick up the sound anyway, even if the person who is using the meter and measuring the sound 
can't hear it. So the problem may not necessarily be completely hidden. I mean, th there are ways that they could identify it. So you're confident that, that the current re regulatory regime would be able to um, deal uh, with, with any issues that arise from, from use of the mosquito device? Well, I think this would simply fall under the general uh, uh, terms of uh, uh, noise nuisance regulations. It wouldn't sit separately or apart from them. Um, and therefore, what is you know, currently in place could be used um, if, if, if there was evidence that that was an issue. I, I guess what John Brownlee is saying is that it is open to any local authority to take you know, their testing machines into any premises uh, or any mall or shopping centre or whatever and establish whether or not they were being used. But I think, to be perfectly honest, the evidence of our eyes when we go around would suggest that they're not being used. But does other, any other member wish to put any points to the Minister? <coughs> Yeah, the other point's just, uh, it's more for completeness, Minister, rather than any particular comment. You, my understanding is this issue is also raised in the European Parliament. I understand that there were some discussions about um, the whole use of mosquitoes in a wider European sense. Um, I understand that the Children's Commissioner has also been involved. And I think the, the issue, I think, from young people in the Youth Parliament, as you, I'm sure, have picked up, is that these devices are discriminatory against a particular uh, group of uh, society and they have real concerns about how this breaches ECHR, which we've touched on earlier on. So the, this is the sort of evidence base uh, that, we, that we've been focusing on. I'm conscious of, I mean, I'm not aware of anything that might be happening at the European Parliament level, so I, I can't comment on that. Right. Well, can I thank you, Minister, for, for uh, coming along and being, I think, very clear on what the government's going to do. Um, uh, and for Mr Brownlee as well. Clearly this is an issue that has been exercised in the committee for some time. We've agreed to discuss our next steps uh, in private, but can I thank you both for coming along and I'll suspend the meeting for two minutes to allow uh, our witnesses to leave. Thank you again, Minister. Could I continue with the uh, agenda? We're now looking at uh, item four. It's PE 1442 by Douglas Reid. On the body upon death becomes part of the estate. Members have a note by the clerks, paper three, the spice briefing and the petition. Could I welcome our witnesses today? Uh, Mr Douglas Reid, uh, Matthew Turner and Leona Turner. Thank you very much uh, for coming along. And could I also uh, welcome Helen Eady. Uh, my intention is to ask um, uh, Mr Douglas Reid to kick off with uh, a five-minute introduction, and then followed by Helen Eady, and then I'll ask my colleagues to ask a series of questions and points about your petition. Uh, you're very welcome for coming along, and can start by asking Mr Douglas Reid to kick off. Thank you. Good morning, uh, and uh, fellow um, <coughs> Scottish parliamentarians. Um, Scotland is one of the most enlightened societies in the world, <coughs> and its laws reflect this. However, from time to time, something does not quite add up. And in this case of your body on death, I feel sure it must have been an oversight, a legal language interpretation, but whatever I and everybody I have spoken to were absolutely astounded to find out that in the 21st century, I could make my desires for my body disposal aware to everyone, also written in my last will and testament, and it could be overruled. Since starting this petition, 
I have encountered people who have experienced various forms of alterations to their relatives' wishes, from cremation rather than burial and vice versa, non-burial at sea, non-burial at a forestry site, non-donation for medical science. The wishes of persons are wide and varied. However, they should be carried out if that was their last wish. Undertakers are in this modern age equipped to deal with any requests. A nice photograph here of a, a hearse that's been pulled by a lovely big motorcycle, just showing the depth that they are, they, they are involved in. They are looking at resumation to answer the concern of the establishment and some people that they do not want to pollute the atmosphere even in death. Also covering the multiplicities of religious denominations in our cosmopolitan population. The donation of your body to anatomical studies is possibly the most thoroughly secure, with checks and balances throughout. But that is an indication of the fulfilling of a person's last wish. They have filled out the requisite forms. The body on death must be put in a temperature controlled state as quick as possible. The embalming is a more long term effect. The aftercare of the, 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 the process is the ultimate of professionalism. To say, to say this is a petition, that is really not the case, I would say. This is not like a campaign, say, on behalf of policies, of wages, better land or housing. People do not very openly talk about death. But like myself, when I found out that my last will and desires could be overruled because of an unfortunate omission in law, then someone has to speak out. I urge your good selves to put in motion the required legal procedures to amend the law accordingly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Reid. Um, Helen Eady. Thank you very much, convener. I'm very pleased to be here this morning to support Mr. Reid. I've known Mr. Reid for uh, 20 plus years, I think now. We've been good friends over that period. And so um, this morning, uh, quite apart from that friendship and that long standing uh, commitment to him, um, I do believe that what he's asking for is absolutely right. And you know, when I think back to uh, my time in the Health Committee, I just wish I had realised at the time when we were putting through the certification of death legislation, I'd realised about this bill, but I didn't know about it then. So I apologise to Mr Reid for not thinking about that, because certainly it's something that, um, had I known, I certainly would have moved some amendments at that time. Uh, but I, I do hope uh, that the committee finds the same merit in what uh, Mr Reid is proposing as I do, uh, because I really do think that it's absolutely the right of an in individual to be able to dispose of their body as they wish. But, I mean, in terms of research, I can't imagine any one of us around this table who would wish to um, overlook or devalue in any way um, the uh, advantages that there is that comes from research when uh, disposing of your body. So it's my pleasure this morning to give absolute support to Mr Reid in his petition and help him in every way that I possibly can, as I have done throughout. Thank you, convener. Uh, thank you, Helen Reedy, for coming along and giving up your time to uh, support the petition. Um, before I put some questions to Mr Reid, I should have emphasised to Matthew Turner and uh, Leona Turner, if you wish to ask any questions or points, please feel free to do so just by raising your hand as if you were in school. Um, Mr Reid, um, you've got a very interesting uh, petition. Have you any particular evidence across Scotland that nearest relatives have changed the wishes of the deceased person's will in terms of body donation? As, as, of, as I said, uh, convener, it, uh, and death is, is, is something that uh, people want to, uh, to do something about, usually when it's too late. Uh, and then they say, oh, I wish I had done this. And, and to talk about it, they, they, they will talk about it, but, but not to sort of stick their hand up and say, you know, count me in. Um, uh, but, but they, and then even after the event, they, they tend to go away and say, oh, I will try and do that. The figures on wills, the making of wills, for example, unfortunately, there's less than 50% of people 
that, that have made a will, and, and there's countless advertisements in the papers and, and all sorts of media forums to try and entice people to make wills through, through your various professional bodies to try and, and do things. And even I had a telephone call last night from the International Wel Welfare Organisation for Animals to try and get myself to put a small endowment towards the saving of, of wild, wild animals. Um, uh, and so, so, so there's that, that aspect of it. The other one, is, as Helen touched upon, um, the, 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 there's no figures in, in, in answer to that. Only, only my, my studies over the last two years since, since, it, since it, the, the thing arose uh, initially. But the, the, the question of, of, of medical research, and as Helen has said, that uh, it's so important education to, to, to make sure that we have the requisite number of, of doctors uh, and, and all sorts of medical professionals, but they need uh, human tissue to, to work on. And if, 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 for example, in my own case, I have made out uh, my, my wishes, and my family uh, uh, are, are all well aware uh, of, of that. But if it's not dealt with immediately, then then the human tissue is is, is of no use to the to the to the medical science. Uh, and unfortunately, this this has happened. The the, the figures um, of the universities, Edinburgh and Glasgow, could could take all the the, the, the human bodies they could they could get. Uh, Dundee is is. Um, uh, Thankfully, due to Su Professor Sue Black's um, influence, is pretty much on, on even, even keel. Um, and uh, uh, Aberdeen and St Andrews, they're not so, not so, 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 so big. Numbers, you've got roughly, uh, well, you have about 50,000 deaths a year in Scotland. Uh, we, this, the universities need anything between 3 and 5% uh, of bodies to do their research. The, 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 the students, there's about 975 students in the whole of Scotland that, 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 um, that need human tissue to, to work on. Not to mention, as, as the universities have told me, the overseas students that come to, to Britain and, and earn income for Scotland uh, because their own countries, Helen, don't allow human tissue to be used. But they come here they get trained, which is a marvellous thing, and then go back and save lives in, in, in their own countries. Obviously, we've helped education, but we've also got the revenue, <laughs> the revenue from them, or at least the universities has. Uh, so, so, so there is figures in some areas, but there's not in the general public, because they're still very, very much apprehensive about talking about death and... And what have you done about Auntie, Auntie Maisie's disposal and, and so on? I, I, I mean, that's on the point you make, Mr. Reed. I think probably the committee would all be agreed that it's important that people uh, do leave a will because there's great dangers with dying the test state. I think also the committee, I think, understand the issue that it is important that people make some provision for organ donation to help medical science. I think the issue I was raising was, is there any evidence that... Um, that wills, the wishes of a deceased person has been changed after they've died. That's probably the key point as far as your petition is concerned, isn't it? And, and, and to, to repeat what I've said, uh, I have nothing other than, than, than what people have spoken to me in that time that, that they did not know, as Helen said, and, and, and people, that in fact that, that your will, your last wishes, could be changed. It must I can only think it must have been an oversight. Thanks for that. I'll bring in John Wilson. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Mr. Reid. Good morning, Matthew and Leona. Uh, the issue for me is quite relevant because it, it was a useful petition to bring forward because earlier this year I was approached by a constituent at my surgery to sign off the medical forms for the individual to donate their body to medical science. The difficulty is then we spent some time discussing it before I signed the paperwork, but it was quite clear there was a dispute within the family uh, and she had to wait an appropriate time to get all the family together to express her wishes about what she wanted to, to happen to her body after she died. But even despite that, there were still some family members who were concerned and were indicating they wouldn't uh, 
adhere to our wish uh, to donate a body. And what your petition has done is brought focus on the issue of the last wishes of someone, or uh, even if they put it into their will, whether or not the next of kin actually has to adhere to that will uh, because the, the body is not part of the estate and they can deal with uh, the remains as they see fit. And while I accept the issue about donating body to medical science is quite clear, Mr. Reid, I would seek clarification from you because you, in your opening remarks you made reference to several ways that the body could be dealt with, and that was the burial at sea, woodland burial, cremation, or burial. Uh, all of those comes, come with costs attached. And while someone may, in terms of their last will, say that they want to be buried in a £10,000 coffin, uh, it's how does the estate and the wishes of that individual uh, be uh, dealt with if the family or the people dealing with uh, the burial cannot afford to actually carry out this, uh, this last will uh, and the wishes of the individual. Because we have to bear in mind that in some respects, someone may wish to have their body disposed of in a particular way, but burial at sea is very cumbersome and very expensive uh, and is fraught with uh, legislative uh, loopholes or pitfalls, I should say, not loopholes, pitfalls in relation to the disposal of the body at sea. So how do, how do we, in terms of your petition, deal with those other issues that you've raised uh, and bear in mind that we may be putting an onus on family members uh, that may be financially burdensome? I, I appreciate what, what, what you're saying, but... I, I don't think it's an answer to, to uh, itemise uh, things. For example, the items that are definitely in your will, that are unalterable, can be of a multiplicity of things. Uh, and indeed, <laughs> can leave a family very much in debt, uh, uh, regardless of, of body disposal. Um, most of the people that, that, that I've spoken to had thought the thing quite well out and had financed uh, and finances to, 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 to account for, for the, the, the particular request. Um, and uh, it's, it's, uh, that, that certainly hasn't, hasn't come up to me in, in, the, in the two years that I've been uh, 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 discussing and talking about it. My, my simple desire is, obviously I could not and, and, and would not attempt to, 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 to cover uh, every type of financial eventuality, but like everything else attached to a person's estate, everything else, everything else, why is it not that their body is not? Uh, and and whatever happens within that, that particular estate would be covered by the respective laws associated with, uh, be it property, uh, material things, um, antiques, uh, you name it, would be, would be covered, but at least the, 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 the body would, would also, and bear in mind, uh, to come back to my, 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 my point was, that, that I'm not here to d defend myself. I'm, <laughs> I'm in a state, a state of, 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 of uh, uh, life ending. I can't defend myself, but I've said, and I've, I've put it in print, uh, and, and, and all I desire is it to be carried out. Yeah, Jackson Carlo. Uh, Mr. Good morning. Morning. I think that the petition you have submitted is underpinned with a very noble object in mind. I, I never mind the cost aspect of it. I'm just, I just am necessarily persuaded that the current arrangement is not sensible and practical. And I'd just like to ask you, in what sense? you think not. I would have anticipated that most relatives and executors of estates would do all they could to honour the wishes of somebody who died. But supposing the individual died abroad, or died at sea, or died up a mountain and it took a fortnight to recover their body, it may not be practical to honour in law the request within the deceased's last will and testament regarding the disposal of their body. 
And it seems to me that the current arrangement obviously obtains for those administered with this task, yes, to do all they can to honour the uh, sentiment of the individual in question, but to have some regard to whether or not that objective is in fact practical. And that to create a law that mandated a responsibility to do exactly what the deceased had requested may simply just not be practical. Again, uh, that, that, that's, that's uh, um, you know, um, thoughts and, and, and practicalities that, that, that are there. My family, uh, uh, for example, at the moment, are fully aware of my desires. But emotionally uh, uh, or, or otherwise, they could become involved with other people uh, that are very persuasive, very, very um, influential, and they could alter the, the views, as indeed uh, uh, the gentleman said, that he'd been uh, involved with a family that was, that was betwixt and between. Um, uh, that's the point that concerns me, <coughs> that, that betwixt and between they may be, but it's not their body. It's my body. And, and the law, um, uh, indeed, uh, I can recall many years ago uh, uh, in, in, the, in the, the, the trade union movement I was involved in, and we, had to, we brought a lady, delegate, who, that died in Malta, and we brought her back to Britain uh, to fulfil her, her wishes. But that was something we, we did because we knew what, what was there. If, if it's practical, a thing would be done. If it's not, you know, then, 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 then of clearly, you, you know, you can't do it. I, the, the, again, coming right back to the, 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 bone, the bone of it, um, I don't think even when, when the legislation about a will was first drawn up, and I don't uh, know when that date was, when, when uh, uh, people were, were, were um, uh, uh, legally... Uh, legislated to, 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 to adhere to, to make a will and be adhered to it, when that was done, whether we had overseas travel or flight travel or, or, or cruises and, and, and emigration and, and all the rest of it, um, <laughs> if we go back to the Australian colonies, if somebody was a criminal and died in Australia, did they, they, they transport them back to, they, excuse me, laughing, they transport them back to Britain to, to get buried in, in, uh, in Perth Cemetery? But, but um, uh, you know, that, that, I'm talking about now, and I have a, I have a vote, I, I, I have uh, rights as an individual, um, and, and, uh, uh, and the, the one thing that, that as I say, I, I, I can only see it as an omission, that I, 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 my basic rights could not be fulfilled. When, let me just add, I accept, as I'm sure the colleague did on the medical research aspect of it, I accept that there may be circumstances that my body will not go to medical science, either because of how I happen to die uh, or, or, or the circumstances that was, that was involved, then the university would not, will not accept me. They will not accept me unless my body is whole and intact and in their receipt in, in, in a limited time. So, so I accept that, that there is a, a, a limitation there. Uh, and uh, let, let me just add a, a thought that came into my mind about expense. Um, I, I know I'm a Scotsman and, and, and a good patriot, I'd like to think. Uh, it occurred to me later on, and some of my colleagues said, uh, trust you, Doogie, but um, uh, when, when you donate your body to medical science, you don't pay for the cremation. <laughs> it's, done for, it's done for you. So, so it's actually a safe increase. Sorry, sir. Thank you for that. Does any other member of the committee wish to ask any questions to our, our witnesses? Right. Uh, Matthew and Leona, do you wish to add anything at this stage? Um, if you could just uh, just to stay in your place just for a second. The, the next section of the meeting is where we then look at what um, we will de how we will deal with the petition and y your evidence and, and Helen Deedes has been very helpful uh, to look at the next steps. Uh, my own view is I think it's certainly worth continuing the petition and asking the Scottish Government for their views along with University Anatomy Department and Her Majesty's Inspector for Anatomy in Scotland. Um, do, does any other committee member have any other views or any additional points? John Wilson. Convener, I'm aware of the Scottish uh, Law Commission uh, looked at a report uh, on the state uh, of a deceased person in 2009 
could I suggest we write to the Commission to ask them their views on this petition and whether or not they think it would be appropriate to give consideration to some of the issues that have been raised by Mr Reid in his petition today. Okay, thank you for that. Does any other member wish to contribute? Our members agreeable with that course of action? Right, thank you for that. It's unanimously agreed. So we're going to continue petition uh, to seek advice from various other organisations and we'll keep you up to date with developments, Mr Reid. And can I thank you again for coming along and for Matthew and Leona and also for Helen Needy. And I'll suspend for two minutes to allow the witnesses to leave. If I can restart uh, the committee, we're on agenda item five, consideration of current petitions. Uh, there are two current petitions for consideration today. The first is PE 1351 by Chris Daly and Helen Holland on time for all to be heard. Members of a note by the clerk, paper five refers and submissions and can invite uh, contributions from members. John Wilson. Thank you, convener. Uh, convener, I note the petitioners have submitted a series of questions. Uh, I think it would be a pro... No, they're not. Uh, I think we've had responses back on that. Right. Yeah. Sorry, convener. No, nothing to add at the present moment. Yeah. I think we've got the Scottish Government's responses um, yeah, to the questions. Um, does that any other committee member wish to uh, add any points at this stage? I think it's a very thoughtful petition. Um, I think certainly it would be useful to seek further information. Um, we might write to, I think, writing to the Centre of Excellence for Looked After Children in Scotland, I think asking it to summarise the work that's taking place on, on the interaction, confirmation of the time scales of, of future work. Uh, there's also a, a general issue um, that the, there is in the future some availability of um, plenary slots in the chamber in the new year, but clearly I think it's probably best that we get some information on the clerks and possible uh, petitions that we could um, have uh, debates on. But that's certainly an option for the committee and a number of different petitions we're considering. But I just flag it up in public so that all members are aware that this is an option. Um, and I think it's useful that we're, we know that other committees have also got interest. So I think we need to make probably a fairly early decision, maybe at the next meeting, about uh, the bit ways forward. Adam Ingram. I certainly think this is a very complex area. Yes. Um, I've had dealings with myself, um, and I think each element of it almost stands, stands alone uh, by itself. The question of um, the time to be heard aspect, where people are looking for the space to actually uh, describe their experience, but that can be quite separate from the issue of compensation or reparation yeah. for, for the difficulties they've faced so, uh, throughout their life. So each one of these elements um, uh, interrelates to the other but can be dealt with on an individual basis. So I think it's very important that um, we do get the, the, the sort of summation, yes. if you like, uh, from um, uh, the, centre, the Centre for Excellence to see where we are with yeah. each of these and that, that would help focus the committee on which area, areas that we need to actually take forward, um, convener. I think that's a very good point. Does any other member wish to contribute? Are members happy with that the way, the way forward? Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, we move on to the second current petition. It's PE 1434 by Norm MacDonald on additional funding for sports facilities and the minimum level of sports facilities. Members, I note by the clerk's paper six and submission uh, can invite uh, contributions from, from members. 
think certainly there's been quite a strong recommendation that we look at uh, referring the petition to the Health and Sport Committee under Rule 15.6.2 because it's doing a current inquiry into community sport. It would seem to be relevant to pass it on. Would committee members be agreeable to that? Agreed. Thank you. That's, that's agreed. Um, and as agreed at item two, the committee will now move into private session for the remainder of the meeting. And I'll just give a few seconds for the gallery to be cleared.